My name is Bob Kahn. I'm from Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. It's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to celebrate David Horn with his colleagues and friends. I first met David when I was a postdoc at SLAC in the early 1970s, though by that time I already knew him as a famous physicist whom I had learned about as a graduate student. I was part of the theory group at SLAC, among whose leaders was Fred Gilman, who introduced the previous session. And through Fred, I met many physicists from both Tel Aviv University and the Weizmann Institute, with whom I've remained friends uh, for many, many years. Fran and I continued to spend time with David and Nira over the years in Berkeley, in Palo Alto, in Israel, and even in Sicily. And uh, as the years have gone by, we've been fortunate to spend more and more uh, time with them. So it's a special privilege for me to be here today. Now it's time to introduce our next speaker, with Professor Haggai Netzer. Professor Netzer received his PhD from Sussex University in 1975 and has been a full professor at Tel Aviv University since 1987. His research interests include the physics and evolution of galaxies and quasars, the growth and evolution of massive black holes, the spectroscopy and photometry of galaxies in the um, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, and X-ray bands. He received the Humboldt Prize in 2005 and the Weizmann Prize for the exact sciences in the same year. Professor Netzer will tell us about black holes, how they're shaping our universe. Mm -hmm. Professor Netzer. So it clips like that. That's it. So I'm, I've been giving some popular talks, uh, so I can tell you what people are questioning me about. <clears throat> they ask me about antimatter. They ask me about gravitational waves. <clears throat> they ask me about wormholes. And they ask me about other universes, and on and on and on. So, so when i uh, um, been asked to give this lecture, I thought that talking about black holes, in fact, is one of the simplest topic of all. And it's really something that we got to understand a lot, and we need to go a little bit backward in time, <clears throat> not to the beginning of the universe, which I'll do in a minute, but back to Einstein in order to understand the concept, first of all. Uh, so I'll spend some time t telling you about the concept, and then I'll go to, to astronomy, what we think they do in the universe, and how they affect the universe, how they shape the universe. And I'm going to start by telling you about trees. So we see a tree in the middle, and what we know about trees in general is that they start from the roots and go up. And as they go up, they get thinner and thinner, and there are all these branches and leaves and everything. So this is a real tree. But we nowadays, we know that, in fact, similar processes or similar configuration also happen in our own universe. So if we look at galaxies, these are, uh, this is a photograph of two galaxies. We can ask the question, how these galaxies, and this is a photograph, it's an image of a galaxy which is relatively nearby, meaning galaxies that is as old as our own galaxy, as old as the Milky Way galaxy. How it, this came about, obviously galaxies were not there immediately after the Big Bang. And there is a picture that works quite well that looks like a tree, a merger tree, but it's upside down. So it starts from very small objects, very early on, as early as the first billion years of the universe, and the universe is almost 14 billion years old. And as time goes by, galaxies merge with each other. They start from the branches, and these two galaxies form a bigger one, and these two and two more form a bigger one yet, and time goes here. So in this particular tree, a merger tree, we are here, some 14 billion years after the Big Bang, and it all started here. But on top of galaxies, 
we know that there are other objects in the universe inside galaxies, and the one I'm going to talk to you about, or mention more than the others, are black holes. A very massive object, I'll tell you in a couple of minutes about the properties, and we know that they sit in centers of galaxies. Where is my mouth? They sit in centers of galaxies, and occasionally something happens that makes them extremely luminous, extremely bright. They can be as bright as 100 galaxies or even 1,000 galaxies. And we nowadays know, and you'll see some evidence later on, that in almost every galaxy that we see around, there is a black hole, a very massive black hole in the center, very massive, I mean, at least one million times the mass of the sun, and it could be one billion times the mass of the sun, even 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And if in every galaxy there is a black hole, whenever two galaxies merge, like in here, something also happened to the black holes in the center. They also merge. And this particular tree, merger tree, includes not only galaxies that are shown here in green, but also the black holes in the center. So if we believe that this is the process that galaxies like ours became and are made today, including all the stars in them, something similar in terms of at least the process must have happened also to the black hole. And what I want to try and, and tell you uh, uh, today, very shortly, of course, because it became a very large area of research, I want to try and tell you what we think is happening and how these black holes in the centers of galaxies are affecting or are shaping the galaxies that we see today. Why without these black holes, our universe, especially our galaxies, including our own galaxy, the Milky Way, would have looked different. So this is the topic that I want to to talk to you about today, so merger, galaxy merger tree and black hole merger tree, and what it means. Some points, some clues, some information about the process. So let's go very briefly about the Einstein black holes. This is a very simple way, not exactly correct way, to look at black holes, but I like it. I think it's the clearest way, so the idea is that if you stand on a massive object and you use a laser light like the one that I'm holding in my way, Obviously, because of the gravity of this, of this uh, very large body, the, the, the light does not go in what we call a straight way, it actually curves. And if I take the entire Earth and, and make it into this size, uh, this size object, keeping all the mass together, of course, gravity will get much larger, and this is the path of the black hole. And there is, there is a point, there is a side beyond which gravity is so dominant, it's so strong, that light will never escape this body, and this becomes a black hole. How large is this? About nine millimeter across, about the size of my fingernail for the Earth. So the idea is like Einstein black hole. Of course, Einstein did not call them this name. The name was invented much, much later. This is the Schwarzschild black hole, and I don't, I'm not going to talk to you about the equation, but I want to show you something that was actually written by Schwarzschild himself. This is his handwriting. And the physicist of us would immediately recognize something that I will not go into detail, that this side of the equations are two terms. And this diverges when R becomes equal to Rs, which the S stands for Schwarzschild. So this is the first solution of the black hole. And when I say solution, the meaning is, of course, Einstein produced or formulated the set of equations, and Schwarzschild was the first one to solve them only one year after Einstein uh, put the, uh, all these uh, equations, in fact, it's one equation with many terms, in 1915, more than 100 years ago. So if you put the, the numbers there, for every object, every mass, you can tell what the size of the black hole is, and I put three sizes here, okay? The sun is about three kilometers the size. If I compress the sun into three kilometers size, it'll become a black hole. The Earth's about nine millimeters, then the entire Milky Way galaxy, about 11 light days. Light day is the, is the distance the light travel in one day. So many of you know that I'm a physicist, and as a physicist, I should be a little bit more accurate. Well, what's the meaning of size? So assume it's spherical. Do I mean the radius 
or do I mean the diameter, or do I mean something else? So size is not a very accurate word to use. And the reason that I use this is because not all black holes, even if they have the same size, the same mass, have the same size. And the reason is that black holes is determined by three properties. One of them is the mass, its mass, and this is the only thing that I showed you here. The next one is the spin, or the angular momentum. And in 19... In uh, 1963, I believe, this physicist, Kerr, found the second solution to black holes. And I'm not, this is the solution, how it looks graphically. I'm not going to go into the detail, only to impress you with the fact that it's now just, not just a spherical geometry. There are many, many terms in, 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 the, in the matrix. And Kerr was the second one to solve this. And he showed that black holes also have another property besides matter, which is the angular momentum or the spin of uh, the black hole. And then, sometimes later, came the electric charge. And we now know that the three properties that define black holes, this is called the Nohel theorem, are mass, big M, angular momentum, big L, and electric charge. Electric charge play very, very little role in astronomy, so I won't talk about it at all. I'll come, a little bit later, I'll come to Kerr, who is still an active physicist. I don't know him personally, and, but this is definitely a very, very big discovery back in the 1960s. Einstein himself did not really think that black holes can be real entities in nature. He did not challenge uh, Schwarzschild's idea, but he said something like, the Schwarzschild singularity da, 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 does not appear uh, in, the, in real order for the reason that matter cannot be con concentrated arbitrarily, etc. Et so what he thought that when you try matter, take matter, a collection of particles, and to compress them, you can never form a black hole because as you compress them, they move faster and faster until at some, at some time, at some moment, they are so close to the speed of light that you can never compress them more because their velocity can never exceed the, the, the speed of light. But nowadays, we know that nature, in fact, found a way to do it. And nature did not agree with Einstein on this particular issue. And the idea is that there is a mechanism that mostly involves some gas in the vicinity of the black hole that rotates around the black hole. We astronomers call it an accretion disk. So the idea that there is some gas, if there is some gas, coming from far away, in the cases we are discussing, from far in the galaxy, all the way close to the central black hole, this gas has usually angular momentum. It, it rotates around the black hole. And because of that, it rotates around the black hole it loses its angular momentum and gets closer and closer and closer. And while the motion here is more or less in circular orbit, as you go closer and closer to the black hole, general relativistic effect become important. The orbit deviates from simple orbital motion. And at some stage, the, orb the orbit orbiting matter, orbiting gas, cannot go in circular orbit and fall into the black hole. And the exact point that it falls into the black hole depends on whether the black hole is stationary, not rotating. This is this one. This is a Schwarzschild black hole. Whether it is rotating, it can be extremely rotating, so we call it Kerr black hole. This is this one. Or whether both the black hole and the disk are rotating, but one in this direction and the other one in this direction. So, so this particular point, uh, um, is, is very important for astronomers to determine what's going on. And as the matter goes closer and closer in through this disk of material, particles collide with each other. They produce radiation. They produce heat. And this heat we saw, this radiation we saw in the optical part of the spectrum. We saw it in X-ray and, and in, in the infrared and ultraviolet. This is the radiation that we see that tell us that there are indeed black holes in these systems. So I'm coming closer and closer to real astronomy, to real observations, and I'm going to say a few words about the edge of the observable universe. So I'm, I'm going to use, of course, a, a 
light years as a measure of distance. One light year is about 10 trillion kilometers, 10 to the 13 kilometers. And the age of the universe is almost 14 billion years, 13.8 is the best number that we have. And we think that the first galaxies were formed roughly 1 billion years after the universe uh, was created in the Big Bang. And therefore, we say that the oldest galaxies are about 12.8. So this 12.8 is simply the 13.8 minus 1 billion. This is the age. And our galaxy is about this age, maybe slightly younger. So the earliest galaxies that did not look at all like the galaxies that you see here, these are galaxies in the nearby universe, real images of galaxies very close to us, which mean that they are 14 or almost 14 billion years after the Big Bang. The early galaxies did not look at all like this. They look more or less like this, actually. And you can't see the detail, or many details, because we are looking at objects that some of them are as old as 12 billion years which means that they are very, very far, and therefore we cannot resolve them, and therefore the image does not show us all the beautiful detail that we saw in nearby, that we see in nearby galaxies, but it's very clear if we look very carefully, and this image was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope that spent a lot of time on one spot in the sky. I'm going to use my finger a lot in this particular talk, much smaller than my fingernail for many, many orbits of the sky telescope and got very, very deep. And many of the objects that you see here, especially the small one, are very, very old, sorry, very, very young. The, the light from them took a long time to get up. And they look very, very different from the galaxies that we see near us. So, so they are at the branches of this merger tree of galaxies, very different from the galaxies that we see inside. But at the same time that we look at the sky with, oh, with telescope, advanced telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope, they take images in optical light, in the same light that we, our eye is sensitive to. There are also X-ray satellite, X-ray telescopes. They take images from the sky. This is one of them. It's called Chandra, after Chandra Seca, a very famous uh, Indian physicist. And this is an image that is being taken in X-ray of the same region of the sky. And all the points that you see here are sources that emit very strongly in X-ray radiation. And we now know that this X-ray radiation comes from the very close region, from the vicinity of the central black hole in the galaxy. In fact, each one of, the, of these find or show us a galaxy where right in the center there is a very super, very massive, super massive black hole. And in the vicinity of this material, which is so hot that it emits X-ray radiation. And we can do the sums. We can do the sum. This is a very, very small area, but we can multiply to get how many sources like that are in over the entire sky. And the number is about 4 billion sources over all the sky. This is about 1 or 2% of the total number of galaxies. So this is a very, very common phenomenon we see X-ray radiation from at least 1 or 2% of all the galaxies that we see around. So this means already that the numbers are very large. On top of it, we know now, and you'll see an evidence in a, in a minute or two, evidence in a minute or two, that many galaxies that do not have this extra radiation also have black holes in the center, but these black holes are dormant. They don't do anything right now. They probably did something in the past. They may do something in the future. But in fact, we think that in every galaxy, or in almost every galaxy, there is a black hole. And this is the best evidence that we have for that. So this is a very, very common phenomena, phenomenon in nature. Uh, how do we know that there is a black hole that is doing something which is different from, from stars? Because we could imagine that this is a very massive star or collection of stars producing uh, producing a, a radiation, the, it looks very different. We, we see images where we really see that something is happening inside the galaxy, some jets going on. This is another example, a jet going in this direction, something that is very, very different from what our sun is doing, from what stars in our galaxies are doing. And on top of it, if we follow the radiation that comes from this in time, we, we know that it can go up and down and up again and down. This is here time, and we follow one object. Along the time, it changes its luminosity, it changes its brighter, its power 
very, very rapidly. And when something varies very rapidly, we can immediately tell something about the size. You know, the, the, the sun cannot vary um, more rapidly than about uh, four seconds because it takes four seconds to cross the, su the, the sun, for the light to cross the sun from one side to the other. So this is already telling us a lot of radiation, like a hundred galaxies, sometimes thousand, and very, very small object because of all this evidence that I showed you. So what are we using to observe this phenomenon? What are we using? How do we know all that? So here's a collection of telescopes that have, people are using, the most modern one in the universe, four very large telescopes in Chile called uh, uh, the Very Large Telescope Array, the largest single telescope in the world. This is in, on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. A space telescope, which is not the Hubble Space Telescope, you can take an aeroplane, and in this particular aeroplane plane, there is a telescope right there looking at the sky. So you can do that, and here is an example of something that already has a name, an extremely large telescope. It's a huge project, a telescope it will be 39 meters across. The mirror is going to be 39 meters across, built by, uh, by a consortium of European countries, many European countries. It's a billion dollar project. It's 1.3 billion euro project, much more than a million dollar project. And it's going to start operating in about 10 years. So there is a very large collection of very, very advanced facilities that look at all these phenomena. I'm going to give you some, more, uh, some, some very specific example, but I want to show you another telescope that I'm more um, uh, that I'm more emotionally attached to. So this, this telescope is a 26-inch telescope. What is 26 about? The mirror is about that, yes? Something like this. And this is the third telescope that it's, it's in the south of England. And you can ask the question, what, what, a reasonable, what a rational person will put a telescope in the south of England, but at that time, this was the Royal Greenwich Observatory. And in fact, this is the telescope uh, that I used to get to write my very first uh, paper about a million years ago. In fact, I can be more accurate about the time. It was exactly the year when David was 35. <laughs> so that's a long time ago, yeah. And so, and I'm also very emotionally attached to our own observatory in, in the Negev, in, in Mitzvah Ramon, a one meter telescope, and nowadays, for many years, it was the only one, and now there are several others, and, and I'm showing you that to show you one, one of the results obtained with our telescope, which I'm very proud of. So what you see here is for every black hole in the universe that we can measure the mass, it is plotted here, almost all of them, about 100,000 objects. So what you see here, <coughs> you see the universe, age of the universe, the Big Bang is here, and we are here, 13.8 billion years later, and every black hole that we observe, <coughs> we can first of all tell the distance, tell how far it is from us, this is the redshift that we normally use, and we also nowadays can measure the mass because we have a a method to measure the mass that was developed at the White Observatory, and you can see how 100,000 black holes are showing here. And you can see that the largest black holes are very active when the universe was about 2 billion years old. So we know how to measure masses of black holes. So we know how much radiation they emit, and we know how to measure the masses. <coughs> um, and let me give you, I know this is from, I know from myself, to remind you, to give you an idea how large the, the, the black hole is. So let's assume that the galaxy is the size of Tel Aviv, of Gush Dan, maybe 10 kilometers from one side to the other. So this is our galaxy. The size of the black hole will be so small that even if I remove my glasses, I will not be able to see it. It's about 1% <coughs> of one millimeter. So 1% of one millimeter containing mass, <coughs> which can be a billion solar masses, but in terms of size, it's nothing. Even the region that produced the radiation is only about 100 times larger. So it'll be one millimeter compared with the size of Tel Aviv. 
And an interesting question is, how can such a small object affect the properties of the entire galaxy? How can a dust speck on this table affect the properties of Gush Dan? Okay, this is what I'm trying to, to, to that I will try to, to show you or convince you uh, is, is a realistic possibility. <clears throat> um, so let, let me say a word about black holes that we don't see as X-ray sources. So black holes can just sit there doing nothing. We call them dormant black holes. And they just do nothing for a certain period of time. It can be a very long period of time. And so almost every galaxy has a black hole in the center. I told you that already. And I want to show you a very famous one, which is in the center of our own galaxy, in the center of our own galaxy contain a black hole. And the, this is a photograph, an image of the, of the center of our own galaxy. So that's a small region, one light here across in, by astronomical uh, standards. And this is the center. And one of these, in this area, there is a black hole. We think that the best location of it here. And when we look at it in, with different telescopes, there must be infrared telescopes or radio telescopes. Uh, it's right in here somewhere. And there is a tremendous effort uh, there was a tremendous effort over many, many years to measure the mass of this black hole, which we now know very, very accurately. 4.3 million solar masses. Very massive black hole, but it's doing so little that it's very difficult to detect it uh, directly. And the reason, one reason why I show you that is, is that I already told you that we have a way, a method to measure black hole mass. But the next question is, can we actually measure the size of the black hole, directly measure? And the answer is probably yes, and probably it will take a few more years, and we will able to, we'll be able to do it. And I want to show you how. The way it is done is to develop a very, very large telescope that have a very, very good resolution, spatial resolution. The larger the telescope, the better the resolution. And the idea is to take many antennas like this. This is a radio telescope uh, sitting in Antarctica, close to the South Pole, and put them at different location on the globe. I think there are six or seven of them. You can see the location. And let them all look at the same part of the sky, the very center of our galaxy. And when they look there, they can reach a tremendous resolution. The resolution is so large my finger is needed again, that if I take my fingernail and put it on the moon and draw two lines across it, this telescope will be able to see that there are two lines and not only one. Okay, this is this, the type of resolution. And the idea is that you look at the black hole there, which you can't see because it's black, but then look at radiation that comes from the background of the black hole. And then this radiation on its way to us goes very close to the black hole. And the idea is to look for this black spot, the part of the image that contains no light because there is a black hole there. This is the idea. And this, in fact, is not going to be just a circle or something simple. It's going to be more complicated because as light goes very close to the black hole, it twisted and turns and is affected by the very strong radiation field. In this animation, you can see what will happen, we think, this is of course numerical uh, simulation, if we take this disk of material and go around and look at it from different directions, and it looks most of, more, most of it like, oops, I'm sorry. Oops. So it looks like so. It's really twisted and turning. But the, the state of this project is that they almost got a resolution that will enable them to look there and measure the size of the black spot in the middle of the image. It's called the Event Horizon Telescope. I've been told by someone that I met last week, very secretly, that they are almost ready to publish their fair results. And he told me it's very, very confidential. So if you tell someone about it, tell them not to tell anybody else, OK? <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm telling you, and please don't tell anybody else, but very soon, 
I think that speaking, they're talking about next year sometime. I'm not sure there's still technical issues. They think that they can resolve it. And if they can be successful in this experiment, they can tell us, they will be able to tell us whether it's a Schwarzschild black hole that is not rotating or it's a Kerr black hole which is, is rotating. And the reason that they will be able to do it is because they have different sizes. The Kerr block hole is exactly twice as small. It's smaller. They hope to do it. Let's see if this will happen. I'm really optimistic about it, but let's see how this happens. So I'm coming now back to the connection between black holes and galaxies. And now we have several other pieces of evidence that there is a very strong connection between these two. And I plotted it here in a, in a, in a way that if I plot galaxy mass here, and black hole mass here, and this galaxy is the smallest, and this is the largest, and then for each one I measure the mass of the black hole inside the galaxy. The larger the galaxy, the larger the black hole is. Larger, I mean more massive. So we know that there is a very, a, a very simple relation. This is just an animation, of course, with very, very strong correlation between the two that hint to us tell us again that the two know about each other, that this dust speck knows about Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv knows about this dust speck. And the connection between the two is obviously the thing or the effect or, or, or the property of the black hole that makes it unique. In fact, the vicinity of the black hole is the huge amount of radiation that comes from the vicinity of the black hole. This is, can be, this is the only thing that can really affect the entire galaxy. And in order to show you how, or to <clears throat> give you some idea how, let me say a few words about the first uh, black holes in the universe. So uh, we think that the first black hole in the universe appeared when the universe was about half a billion years old, or maybe even slightly younger, roughly the same time that the first stars appear, large, uh, 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 clouds of matter at that time, mostly hydrogen and helium, condense, collapse together. Most of it forms stars. Some of it fall, form in a quite complicated way that I will not go into, and we don't fully understand, form an uh, initial black hole. And then black holes started to grow. And the way black holes grow, they accrete material. More material, more gas come from the vicinity and makes them larger. And eventually they settle into the centers of the galaxies where we see them today. And because there's plenty of gas in galaxies, especially in the early galaxies, there was plenty of gas. Early galaxies can contain 50 and even 80% of the mass in gas. Some of this gas finds its way to the center, accreted onto the black hole, and the black hole gets larger. So black holes, in fact, get larger in, in two ways. One is by a critic matter, and the other way is the one that I started with, when galaxies merge, black holes merge too. This is the way they grow. It's a very, it's a very, very uh, uh, short story that I told you, but of course many, many uh, examples. And nowadays, we have very good say, computer simulation. The, the, the sound here is not very important. It looks like this. In fact, this is a quite a primitive. Uh, consider today's simulations that show us what happened when galaxies collide, when galaxies merge, and what is left behind. They can do it for the stars in the galaxy, and they can do it less accurately for the black, hole, black holes in the center. And this is a snapshot of two galaxies colliding, very early stages, later stage, or later still. So as they start from here and eventually go to here. So two galaxies here, the end result is just one galaxy here, two black holes here, and one black hole here. And this process is going on all the time, and of course it can have very different shapes and, and, and detail depending on the, on the galaxies that collide and depending on the black holes in the center. And this is exactly what happened in this merger tree. So galaxies collide, black holes collide, and each one of them grows separately. The black holes grow because they accrete matter. So I'm coming now on the effect of, of the black hole, how they shape the galaxies. And so let me think with you a minute about what happens if you swallow one sun every year. Okay. 
So I know what will happen to me if I do it, but let, let's think what will happen to, to uh, the galaxy if I swallow one sun every year. It's very easy for us physicists to calculate how much energy will be radiated because what happens in such process about 10% of the mass of the object that is being accreted, of the gas which is being accreted, is released at radiation. The efficiency of converting mass to radiation is about 10%. It's unbelievably large. In, in, in nuclear fusion, it's more like 1%, okay? So the center black holes accrete gas. It produces electromagnetic radiation that exceeds the solar radiation by 10 trillion, 10 to the 13 times. This is about the luminosity of 100 large galaxies. And the radiation inter interacts with the gas in the galaxy and stop star formation. Let me try and show you a simulation of this. So, so I mean, what's written here in, in three sentences can be translated to at least a thousand papers, okay? And this story is not over, but let me try and, and illustrate this. So the idea is that the black hole in the center of a galaxy produces radiation. This radiation goes through the galaxies and clean a path. The radiation pressure push on the gas and on the start and change the property and actually blow away some of it to the outside. So this is a simulation that shows you that. What you have to look at, this is the black hole, radiation comes out, push gas around plus radiation around. It will come again, and now look at these bright spots, these are regions where stars are forming. And you see that this shock, it's really a shock wave going through the galaxy, actually stops star formation. Galaxies grow by mergers and by forming stars, converting gas to stars. And when you stop star formation, the galaxies stop going. And this is the most clear way, the best one that we can think of, and we see clear evidence for that that black holes, by producing all this radiation, actually affect the growth of the galaxies that they sit in. So this process is called feedback, and it's been studied in many, many times. So there's feedback, the black hole produces feedback on the gas in the galaxy, and this affects the growth of the galaxy. So uh, since I'm coming towards the end, and since uh, what's in the news nowadays are uh, black hole mergers and neutral star mergers. So let me spend a couple of minutes, no more, no more on this. So this is a LIGO uh, detector uh, in, in the United States. There are in fact two parts of it, one in Louisiana and one in, in Washington, the state of Washington. And this is the one that got the first result of detecting gravitational waves from two colliding black holes. This happened about two years ago, and the Nobel Prize for this discovery was, uh, was uh, awarded about a month ago, even less than a month ago, to three people in this huge collaboration. And I'm not going to go into the detail of it, except to tell you that the black holes that did that, in fact, there are five such events known already, are in fact much, much smaller than the black hole that I was telling you about. There are about 20 or 30 solar masses each. I told you about black holes that are millions and billion times larger than the sun. So they are not this type of object. So what can we do if we want to understand the detail of what happened to black holes in centers of galaxies when the galaxies collide? And this particular detector called LIGO, and there is another one in Italy called Virgo, cannot measure such events. It's the range of sensitivity and the range of frequencies is not suitable. And the idea is to try and build a very different, in fact, a much larger experiment called LISA. You can see the, why it is called LISA, laser interferometer space antenna. And this is the concept. The concept is to send, to launch three satellites. And they will form a triangle, a huge detector, which is a triangle made of three legs. The difference or the separation between this and this is about two million kilometer or two and a half million kilometer. I don't remember the exact number. And this particular one 
will be tuned to detect the merger of two massive black holes when two galaxies collide. And the experiment is going uh, very well. It stopped for a while, and now it's been renewed because of the latest development. But it's not very clear what will happen to it. The, the, the cost of the experiment is $2 billion, OK? Now the launch date is 2030. And uh, anything which is more than two years in the future, I kind of suspect. I suspect not that it will happen, but suspect that the, uh, the, the, the date is correct. There was a very uh, important step that ended about the last year, in fact, finishing now, showing the feasibility, a much smaller satellite that was launched, and showed that this particular node, each one of them, the technology that is needed is going to work, and, and the three legs are going, to be, uh, are going to be connected by laser beams, and the idea is to, to measure very, very small shrinking or expansion of the distance between these satellites. And this it will be translated to the strength or the intensity of the gravitational wave that come from colliding, merging black holes. And in this particular case, if it will work, the time that we will have to measure the merger or the time this detector will be effective can be as long as 24 hours. In fact, in some cases, it can take a few weeks. And this is, I'm comparing this to the very few detections that were already, that I mentioned before, that took a split of a second, less than one-tenth of one second. So when this works, it, we, we will have much more time to look at the event, to identify it in the star, in, in the sky, and to learn much more about the properties. But what, what are we going to do about the cost? That's a very important question. Two billion dollars. And astronomers in the crowd know that when they say two billion, it very quickly goes up to three and four and even more. We know such example. <clears throat> so I, <clears throat> I decided that I have to help these people to get the money. So what I did, as in the previous lecture, I took Google and said, Lisa. And what I got as a first at the top of the note was Mona Lisa. And I don't know if you know, I just learned about it, that the Mona Lisa is now estimated to be the cost of $790 million. So how about selling the Mona Lisa? <laughs> Even in auction, in fact, you can get even more and use it to finance the Lisa that we physicists love so much. That's a difficult question to answer. I'm not sure what my answer is, given, given the option. <clears throat> so I told you briefly why we think that black hole shaped the universe. <clears throat> I talked about objects that, <clears throat> that are a few billion years old. We follow them from when the universe was half a billion years old until today, almost 14 billion years later. And I thought that could be connected with 80 years. Not a few million years, billion years, but 80 years. And I thought, how? And what came to my mind is a story that they tell about Shimon Peres. I'm not sure it's about Shimon Peres, but since he passed away more than a year ago, all stories always go to Shimon Peres because it was so wise. So, <laughs> so uh, the story is that, uh, you know, he was um, the director general of the defense ministry at age 28. 28, uh, very unusual. And, and the story is as, as the person come to him and, and tell him, uh, Mr. Peirce, don't you think that 28 is too young to manage such a big operation? And his answer was, young age is the only defect that goes away with time. <laughs> so David, you and I do not have this defect <laughs> anymore. And I think the way I, I look at what you've done and what you're capable of doing uh, uh, at this age, it reminds me of a phenomenon that lasts for a very long time. This particular black hole that I told you about, they were very efficient in affecting the shape of the universe 10 and 12 billion years ago. They are still affecting the shape of the universe and the galaxies that are on. And, and I wish you 
that you will be able to affect science and your surrounding for many, many years to come. So many happy returns of it. That's right, yeah, that's right. That's right, no, so I'm only focused on the central black hole in the galaxy, which is by far larger than every other thing, but every galaxy, including ours, contain many, many much smaller black holes, definitely. And another question, why did you say that it doesn't have an extra This one? Because, you know, there is material going close to the black hole, and if it's close enough, it's a crit. But if there's no material coming in, it will not accrete anything, and will not. No, it just sits there, and then something happens in the galaxy, pulses in the galaxy, star forming, gas is being driven away from star forming regions, and there is more gas getting to the center. But if nothing in the center, it's just dormant; it's not doing anything, and it does not grow. I don't remember the exact number, but in terms of merging uh, uh, massive black holes, they're talking about a few every year. So uh, the lifetime of the mission right now is scheduled to be uh, four years, if I'm not mistaken. So I think in total it'll probably be a few dozen cases, maybe a bit more. But there are other cases with different frequencies. That's about a rough number, but I don't remember the, the exact number. Yes? Okay. Yeah, because um, the, the signal is in fact going to be much weaker. So the, what happened in these detectors, what you measure is the relative change in size, in length of this laser beam. It's the relative one. But, so the relative one is proportional to the strength of the signal. But what you actually measure is, is real extending, extension or real shrinking. So, you know, if it's the relative is 10 to the minus, relative size change is 10 to the minus 21. This is roughly the number. If you take a much, much wider or longer beam, the actual physical size increase will be much larger. So this is one reason you want to be able to measure very, very tiny effect. The other one is that each one of these effects have different frequencies. And the size of the experiment tell you what frequency you can measure. And the frequencies of when two massive black holes going around each other is much, much smaller than what we see in, in the small one. So it's a, it's, it's a combination of sensitivity, size that you have to measure, and frequency. So the, it, really, the, it really takes a different type of detector. The, the ones that we have now cannot do it. Yes, if there is dark matter in the, in the vicinity of black holes, it will get accreted onto the black hole. <clears throat> and there is no reason why, if there is enough concentration of, of dark matter, we will have a black hole which is mostly made of dark matter. Of course, it doesn't matter after you, it doesn't matter if it's dark matter because after you swallow it, it's all the same. The point is that we know that the concentration of dark matter in the universe is very, very small. So there's no way you can collect enough material near the center to make an appreciable change in the black hole size, in the black hole mass. Yeah, there's another question. Uh, you mentioned that the Consists of funding agencies. It does not have the staff of the CERN, 
Yeah, I absolutely agree. Optimistic, and I'm optimistic too, especially after the last uh, latest discoveries. They will find the money, I know. The galaxies actually, most of the growth is not due to merger, but the, the early universe contained only gas, and this gas became stars. And once the gas reached a certain part of the, of the, of the, uh, of volume, it starts producing stars. And galaxies grow most producing stars. Also by merger, mostly by producing stars. away this gas, stars will and the galaxies will not go.